Lobel Tikri of the Independent Speculator is back to give us his outlook for 2023 on the metals. Lobel, welcome back. I appreciate you coming on the show today. And uh, we'll be talking about uh, gold, silver, and the other yellow metal that did really well. No, it's not gold. It's uranium. Gold was flat on the year if you count just over the last 12-month period. But uranium is up slightly. We had a huge run-up earlier in the year. Let's talk about that first. Why do you think uh, – what happened with the uranium price? We have a chart – that will show up on the screen here. Uh, towards the middle of February and um, up until mid-April, it shot up by 50%. So it went up from about $43 a pound to more than $63 a pound. And then it came back down very sharply afterward. It was like a big V-shaped spike, well, inverse V-shape. What happened there? All right, well, let's put a little bit of history. First, happy holidays, everybody. I'm glad to be on with you, David, at this time. It's been a really interesting year, and I think we're headed for a doozy in 2023, so this is timely. And I think it's debatable which one really counts as the other yellow metal this year. If uranium delivered gains for investors in that space and gold's been waffling sideways, if not causing people's hair to fall out, you know, who, who gets the, the uh, backhanded compliment of the other yellow metal? We'll leave that to the audience to decide. But let me put some context for you here. And, and this is really important because people lose sight of it. Yeah. Um, especially when uranium is pulling back, then you know, they they think something's wrong, something must be bad. But the, the bigger picture is that the bottom was about five years ago. And we've been seeing uh two steps forward, one step back, sawtooth pattern in uranium for years now. Mm -hmm. And that trend remains uh unviolated on a technical basis going upward. So I'm not a technician. My technical friends tell me this. Um, but I think that's really important. That's that's the context. So you could just say that what happened this year was par for the course. That's what uranium has been doing for the last several years. Uh, and it, I think it's important because there are a lot of sort of headline news items that could be seen as explanatory, but this was already going on. And I think that matters. I think what happened last year with SPUT the Sprott Uranium Trust, hoovering up all those low cost pounds, removing them from the market was a real game changer. And we were seeing higher prices going into 2022 before the major headlines that move things around. Now, of course, the advent of the war in Europe had a big impact, but initially actually the impact was negative for uranium. We had scares about shelling around the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, largest nuclear plant in Europe. And could there be a big disaster that actually hurt spot uranium prices and hurt the companies more? Uh, and then later we had the, the sanctions or the fear of sanctions and particularly fear that Kazakhstan might get caught up on the Russian side of the new Iron Curtain. And of course, Kazakhstan is the largest and lowest cost producer of uranium in the world. So these things, I think, contributed to extra volatility, an extra size two steps forward this year. Um, and then, you know, the plant didn't have a meltdown and Kazakhstan didn't get cut off from supplying the world from uranium. Uh, you have more specialty issues with products, you know, enriched uranium from Russia, but generally speaking, uranium itself is doing okay. And the supply hasn't gone away because of these well, these things. So we saw a big surge. We saw the market realize, hey, things aren't so bad. It's come back. But that doesn't mean that's the end of the day. Remember the bigger picture, the five years that I'm talking about of two steps forward, one step back. We just saw a particularly large uh, step forward and step back. And the good news is that in this step back, I do think that is a buying opportunity. The the fundamentals backed up by the technicals, but I'm a fundamentalist. They've really never looked better in my career for uranium. The about face in Europe, the number of plants that the BRICS countries are building, the, the new advanced nuclear that's being built in Canada and China, and the U.S. is pushing in that direction. I mean, the even Greta Thunberg said that Germany shouldn't shut down its last nuclear reactors. I mean... <laughs> She's not the leading expert on uranium that I would consult first, um, <laughs> but that tells you something about the momentum in this space. It's an idea whose time has come, and so I do see the current step back as an opportunity. Uh, well, demand and market sentiment and perhaps public sentiment is one thing. What about the supply issue? 
Uh, back in 2007, you'll recall we had a massive bubble in the uranium market. It shot up to $135 a pound and then it, again, fell rapidly back down. Uh, some of it was due to the fact that uh, Cigar Lake, uh, one of the largest uh, deposits in the world at the time, I think was flooded, if I got my news and history correct. So there was uncertainty around how supply would be generated. Um, any such supply issues coming out of the market today? I, I understand That's that actually, a lot of the miners, um, yeah. you know, are underproducing because the price is still relatively low, but that's a yes, long-term issue. Yes, that now. last point is growing. And this is why some very smart people I know, uh, you know, they get it. They understand the things I'm talking about with the new plants coming along, the demand side, but the supply side concerns them. And, and it is somewhat like OPEC in that you have the biggest producers in the world, uh, Cameco, the Cigar Lake, one that you mentioned, that single mine is still you know, like the largest single producer in the world. And that company, along with Kazatomprom in Kazakhstan, both supply a very large portion of the uranium to the world. Um, Justin Hune, the uranium insider, could probably reel off the exact numbers off the top of his head. <laughs> but I, I'm not just a uranium specialist. But anyway, um, so yeah, that that's important, I guess, history, because people... People are hoping that that will repeat, that we'll see another spike like that this time. I'm actually not convinced that's going to be the case at all. When we saw that huge spike in 2007, uh, Cigar Lake was shut down by flooding because Adam Prom wasn't a factory yet. It, that was still starting to come together over there. So that single thing really put a supply squeeze into the market. Now we have the opposite. We have these big producers that have shut down their mines or or cut them back, cut back production voluntarily, like OPEC to prop up prices. And that keeps people, like I say, some very smart people, they just don't want to invest in uranium because they think, well, it's an artificial scarcity and there'll be more supply that can just come online. Um, but it's not so easy. You don't just snap your fingers and, and turn the uranium mine back on, especially the hard rock ones. I mean, there's, there's a lot of care and maintenance that has to be ramp back up again to get into production. But even the in situ ones, the pumping mines, you know, the, the fastest ones I've heard from some of the operators is nine months, 12 months, that sort of thing. And we are starting to see this. So I don't want to be too long-winded. What I'm saying is I think it's a legitimate concern to say there has been voluntary supply con uh, constraint and yeah. that can come off. Yeah. But at the same time, I think we're seeing that the those same suppliers are being disciplined about coming back to market. Uh, Kazadam Prom in particular, they are saying that by next year or 2024, they're going to ramp back up about 10%, but they had cut 20%. So they're not just flooding back all the way. Even as they come back on, they're not coming back all the way. Uh, and we'll see, uh, you know, Cameco has issued very vague guidance about how much production they're going to be seeing from uh, MacArthur River, their number two project there that they're bringing back online. You know, th their care and maintenance costs were so high, it, it makes sense for them to bring it back online, but not to flood the market and hurt themselves. So we're seeing discipline there and we're seeing the demand side really picking up. So I, I'm, I'm quite bullish on this. Uh, before we talk about your outlook, I'd like to examine the outlooks of some other analysts and financial institutions this year regarding uranium. Perhaps you and I together can examine where some of these um, assumptions that they made uh, went wrong. Of course, nobody has a crystal ball. Not everybody is right all the time. We have to preface that. But sometimes the assumptions themselves are are, are perhaps more important than the call uh, themselves. So, uh, so this came out in April uh, of this year. A Bloomberg article dated April 28th said that last week, so uh, it was still the third week of April when this report came out. The Bank of America released a research note showing that the spot prices for uranium had increased significantly and that it will spike more than 50% in 2022. I think they were giving a year-end forecast. Now, uh, the uranium price did not spike another 50% after that report was written. In fact, it stayed relatively flat to down. Now, one of the assumptions they made was that there would be supply chain issues. Uh, this article, particular article, wrote that in terms of enrichment, Russia makes up roughly 45% of global capacity. In conversion, the Eastern European country makes up nearly 30% of the estimated production of this year and about 20% of international capacity. And according to the report, an analyst at the Bank of America stated that the increases in price observed was primarily driven by concern about disruptions in the uranium supply chain. Bank of America added that most of this activity fueling the rise in price was driven by the Spot Physical Uranium Trust, 
as opposed to producers or utilities that were actively participating in the market. I think so. What they're saying is that the huge spike that we saw was driven by a few uh, one-off factors like uh, concerns about uh, uh, the supply chain being cut and, of course, spot entering the market, which was last fall, I believe. Uh, Lobo, why didn't we have huge disruptions in the supply chain? following the Ukraine war. This was a legitimate concern. I mean, Russia was a big player, and yet we still had uranium. Well, but Russia is a bigger player in the um, more advanced parts of the fuel cycle, which the okay. end buyers have planned out years in advance. I mean, this isn't the sort of thing that there's a disruption today, and then suddenly the utility is running nuclear power plants you know, goes to the store and there's nothing on the shelf. It's not like that. They have these, they have things set up, you know, years in advance. Uh, and remember that if we're asking, you know, about spot uranium, U308, that's a different earlier stage of this whole cycle. So I'm sorry, but the actual, you know, an, an actual good, clear answer here would be quite complicated about mm -hmm. all these different moving parts and pieces and the UF6 and yeah, all this stuff. But But just remember, there was a fear that Kazakhstan would get caught in this web and would end up being cut off as a part of supply. That didn't happen. It's not Russia. You know, it didn't end up on the other side, at least for this business of the of the new Iron Curtain. Russia itself is a bigger player on more advanced products. Like right now, Bill Gates' uh, project for an advanced nuclear reactor, they're just headlines out this week about how that's going to be looking at a two-year delay because the high assay, low enriched uranium, helium that they use, they were getting from Russia and there isn't any supply in the US. There is a company working on that, uh, has a US grant, uh, but they're, no, they're not supplying it yet. So, so there are little niche places like that where you saw an, an immediate impact, but the overall uranium market, you know, the spot market for U308, it's global, it's fungible, and Russia wasn't that big a part. Um, okay. So, actually, let me let me throw one more thing in here, though, David, because right. we talked about this the voluntary supply constraint. But even if that goes away, and even if you know Kazakhstan and Canada pump out all the uranium they can, the the mine supply is still not enough on that basis. What was keeping the market down for so long was the secondary supply, was the Japanese who had shut down the reactors. And I know you've talked to Rick Rule about this before. You know, they had all this uranium that they didn't need anymore. That sort of thing. And that's gone away. The, the Japanese have, have ramped up their restarts. And then there's Sprott hoovering up the other cheap pounds that are out there. So I, I really, you know, people hate to hear this time is different. You but know, this market has, in fact, changed. Let me present to you a long-term, perhaps bearish case for uranium. This is super, super long-term. This is not. This is bordering on the realm of sci-fi, although not sci-fi anymore. It's scientific reality. Just this uh, couple weeks ago, actually last week, major, major breakthrough coming out of the U.S. Nuclear fusion has finally been achieved to be net positive in energy, meaning that for the first time, scientists in the laboratory. Have, rep, have created nuclear fusion on a smaller scale and produced more energy than the uh, reaction required to take in. Um, obviously, we're not at the commercialized stage yet, but it's important to know that nuclear fusion as a process doesn't require any fuel. It's just burning hydrogen in a very complex form. It's not like nuclear fission reactors that require uranium and plutonium. Um, perhaps in the future, if this were to become a commercially viable way of producing energy. First of all, we would completely revolutionize energy uh, production because this would solve every single country, the, the world's energy needs several times over. But second, we wouldn't need uranium anymore, right? What's your reaction to this? Uh, it's not relevant to me as an investor right now or a okay. speculator. And I wouldn't call it science fiction. I think eventually that does happen. You know, maybe 20, 30 years from now, you know, the, that's the major power source for the world and, and everything is cleaner and better and yay, happy, happy, joy, joy. That doesn't tell me what stock to buy today to make money this year or the next. Um, you know, maybe if I had a 30 year investment time horizon, that would be interesting. But I, I just think that's crazy. Nobody can have a, even right. if you're that far ahead thinking about the, the future and where to go, 
that's a that's a strategy that's a thought that's a very macro kind of idea it doesn't tell you what stock to buy today i'm i'm you know, we've talked about this before right like our friend rick rule likes to say it's a mistake mm -hmm. to confuse the inevitable with the imminent mm -hmm. and so different forms of energy inevitable yeah i'd say that's probably true imminent absolutely not and in terms of making money you know my goal isn't to be a you know a, a seer predicting the future my goal is to make investments now that make me money in the next year or two. Okay. That's my investment time frame. So just just not relevant. And this applies by the way to thorium and other different kinds of yes. things that people say are going to eat uranium's lunch. You know, it it is the choice right now. It is it is part of the power mix. Even the Europeans have, you know, done it at 180 and and are charging into the uranium space. This is happening now. It's not just inevitable or even imminent it is happening now and mine supply is insufficient mm -hmm. uh final point on uranium so you're you're, you're long-term bullish your thesis is long-term bullish i know you don't like giving price forecasts but uh what is your outlook for 2023 in terms of uh growth are we are we still seeing sort of the sideways pattern or do you think there are certain trigger events that could potentially push up the price yeah i'm you know, I am a speculator. I am looking ahead. So it's not that I'm unwilling to forecast, you know, a, a direction or a goal, but I don't like setting a price target. Like, no, I understand. You know, by the end of 2023, it's going to be $70 and 52 cents. Like nobody knows that. That's a silly number. But my, my outlook is that, you know, it's not like 2007 there, you know, there's not one mine that can be shut down and, and make that happen. You know, potentially, uh, something happening with Kazakhstan and the war or something, you know, that could do something like that. But that's not really the most likely scenario. So I'm looking at continuing volatility upwards. I think we're already starting to see, uh, you know, what that incentive price is. It's It's been a theoretical thing. So my forecast is that over the course of 2023, we will see uranium hit the incentive price. And, you know, we'd have guests on these shows and ask them, well, I think it's this, I think it's that. But we're starting to see what that is because the developers out there, the people that have been sitting on uranium projects for years, waiting for higher prices, they are starting to build those mines now. That has started to happen now. So that incentive is visibly on the horizon. And then there's one more data point I'll put in here. And that is just this week, this is quite timely, we're having this conversation. I'm not just a uranium bug. <laughs> I do cover other things, but this is very timely. The United States government has been talking about setting up this national uranium uh, stockpile, just like the strategic political reserve, I mean, petroleum reserve. Yeah. Um, and they finally started doing that. And those contracts, we've finally starting to see prices come out now. Um, several of the U.S. Uh, producers or stockpilers or, or, or mothballed producers, you know, they've got uranium. Several of them have announced new uh, sales contracts with the United States government. The prices are That's in, right. you know, plus or minus around 60. So when you talk about incentive pricing, you know, a lot of those guys, they have these uranium pounds on the books at, you know, 20 bucks, 30 bucks, whatever they mind them at, you know. So this is a big deal for them. That's but, right. but just think about what's happening. One, we have a new buyer on the market that wasn't there before. That's important. Two, You've got people with pounds, primary producers that are willing to sell them 60 to 70 bucks. That tells us something. This is real data, not just wool gathering about incentive prices. So my forecast is we'll probably see uranium head higher over the next year. Easily, you know, 60 is very easy as a floor. 70, I think, is doable, maybe up to 80. Markets overshoot. Maybe it goes to 100 bucks or something like that just because people get excited. Okay. Uh, but I think it settles above the incentive price because that's what that's what supplies the market. Just to so, clarify, the incentive the incentive price is what exactly? It is yeah, well, it's a, actually it's a quite good question. It is uh, not an officially accepted term. There's no industry standard yes, that yes. sets this. But you know, think about it. you've got cash costs, then you've got all in sustaining cost, another misnomer, all in sustaining cost doesn't include taxes for example. But the incentive price is basically everything, kitchen sink in there too, that you need to be able to make money. And that includes cost of capital too, right? So it's your financing cost as well. So it's much more than just, you know, it cost me 40 bucks to mine this pound of uranium. I need a lot more than 40 bucks to make the whole business worthwhile. And what we're starting to see 
as you know, the guesses we had before of, you know, 60, 70, 60 is probably for the low cost, for the whole industry, maybe 70 or 80 is what the data is starting to tell us now. Uh, and that means that uranium has, it's, it's still unlike almost any other metal or commodity you can think of, it's still below the cost that's required to incent its supply to the marketplace. And that that makes me extremely bullish in this space. Okay, so about $70, we'll probably see that uh, next year. Well, thank you for that forecast. Uh, you did come out on the limb, so I appreciate that. You know, just circling back to your philosophy on giving forecasts, does that apply to your trading and investing as well? Do you think to yourself, I mean, it's one thing going on, on TV and giving a forecast, but do you think to yourself, once it hits a certain target, I'm out, I, I, I sell? Or, or do you have a different type of uh, target philosophy here? Like, how, how, do you, how, do you, how do you decide when to exit? That's a good question, David. And in fact, remember, I'm not a mainstream investor. I, sure. I'm not looking for something that just barely gives me more yield than a, than a bond, right? You know, before Tina, there is no alternative. That was mainstream stocks versus bonds. I'm not like that. That wasn't the way I was thinking at all in general. I'm looking for extraordinary gains. I want, you know, doubles, triples, triples, five baggers, 10 baggers. I don't swing for the bleachers on twin bag, 10 baggers very often, but since I'm looking for such outsized gains, you know, it's ridiculous to say it should be 10.25 times or something like that. I don't have price targets. So this philosophy I have of not issuing price targets, I do apply that in my own investing. Mm -hmm. I'm just happy if I get the direction and the magnitude right. If, if I buy a stock and I think they're going to build the mine, or they're, or this discovery looks real. It's going to be a big multi-million ounce, or they're going to get taken over, and that happens, um, and I get paid. Then that's that's my success. I, I literally have no uh, price target for any of my speculations, and I don't sell because that's it hits this price. I sell because it got taken over, and I don't want to own the new company, or it's an offer for cash. Or I sell because they built the mine and now it's a producer and I want to roll my money back over into another mine builder or something like that. Okay. Or I sell because it fails, right? The company doesn't do what it said it would do and it's time to take my loss and move on. So I'm quite data dependent, I guess, is the popular phrase these days on this. Uh, and so I think this, case by this case may basis, sound like yeah. a philosophical, you, you, you phrased it as philosophy, David, but I think this is important. Mm -hmm. Because I think people leave a lot of money on the table saying, oh, here's my price target. I haven't reached it yet. It's 90% of the way there. And they leave all that money on the table. And then the trade goes sour on them. And, they, and that gain slips through their fingers. You see what I'm saying? It, it just, I'm a fundamentalist. I look at what's really happening. And is this stock delivering or not? You know, that's how I make my decisions. Okay. All right. So more... I would say qualitative than quantitative. Well, if people can learn more about your work, go to the independentspeculator.com where they can find your stock picks as well. Uh, well, speaking of 10 baggers, is gold going to deliver a 10 bagger this year? <laughs> Let's finish up on gold and silver. Well, I am very bullish on both. I think we've talked before about how we've had, I was right, by the way, about stagflation for 2022. I think, you know, you can debate semantics about well, are we sure. really in recession or not? The two quarters and all that stuff, I don't know. But but you look at the high prices and you look at the economic pain in many quarters, and I think it's fair enough to say that we saw stagflation in 22. You certainly saw it in, in Europe and the UK. Um, but gold didn't go through the roof. And when you and I talked about this before, I'm pretty sure I didn't promise, I didn't give you a price target. Oh yeah, gold's going to 3,000 or 2,752 or whatever the number was. Um, and I'm glad I didn't. And what's been missing here is this um, inflation expectation thing. You know, Back in the 70s, when we had stagflation, that one example everybody refers to, everybody and their cousin had this expectation of higher prices. And that is really, you know, that drove consumer behavior, that drove everything else, and it drove interest in gold because you knew that the, the dollar was losing value. People don't feel that way. They don't know that right now, even though it's true. Um, so I expect painful uh, reality to set in the economy, you know, more undeniably in the U.S. in 2023. I expect inflation to stay stickier 
than the people who think recession will cure inflation um, expect. Mm. And I think that will set into consumer expectations. I think that will be very beneficial for gold and silver. I don't have a price target, but I think 2023 will be better for gold and silver than 2022 was. How's that? Okay. One of the big problems for gold this year was a strong U.S. dollar, uh, which was partly spurred by uh, the raises in the short-term uh, part of the curve because the Fed kept raising rates. And uh, with that came uh, rising real interest rates. Are you then assuming that next year, should gold perform better than this year, we'll see a weakening U.S. dollar and perhaps a less aggressive Fed? Uh, yes and no. Two things on that. Uh, the dollar wrecking ball, the dollar milkshake theory, whatever you want to call it. Yes, we saw this dollar strength. And the fact that gold is actually sideways in a year that the dollar arose so much and real interest rates turned, they're still negative, but they turned decidedly less negative over the course of the year. I think that gold actually outperformed how, you know, based on what anybody would have expected given the drivers over the last few decades for gold. Sure. Um, so I do think that the dollar is overdue for correction. I think that the Fed led the way in tightening. And it's already visibly leading the way, and if not loosening, then at least slowing down, right? The Fed, even Powell has talked about, you know, we went from 75 to 50, maybe we do another 50, 25 next. But the Fed is talking about pausing to see what the long and variable lags do for the policy already done. Whereas Christine Lagarde is over there talking about 50 basis points steadily. You know, you know we have a steady policy. We have a lot more work to do. So... The ECB is sounding more hawkish directionally than the Fed. I think if that plays out, if that actually happens, if the Fed goes 75 in February and the ECB stays with 50, sorry, if the Fed goes 25, excuse me, and the ECB stays with 50, I think the dollar goes down hard. And that will be good for alternatives, including the euro and gold and silver. Uh, you know, writ large going forward into 2023, I do think Europe will have a more difficult time fighting inflation than the U.S. Uh, the um, the base effects will hit Europe later. They're already hitting. Like we have basically 7% plus now going forward. All the base effects in the U.S. are 7% plus. So that's a much bigger hurdle for big numbers in the U.S. Okay. So, yes. I'm, I'm taking the position that I think it's the dollar's turn to weaken, but that's not the only thing. Uh, this other expectation thing that we talked about, you know, it, or it could be that systemic risk, as we saw in the UK, causes the ECB to blink. You know, Lagarde is saying 50 basis points steadily, but they may not have the guts to do it. Um, but if there's systemic risk, then you have fear and that safe haven demand. So we could actually see gold and the dollar go up at the same time. If we get serious, like UK style disruptions, something yes. breaks, then we could actually see the fear factor make gold and the dollar go up at the same time. So it's not all my eggs in the basket of, of dollar bear. Okay. It's depending on how it plays out. All right. So just to close off, one final question for you, Lobo, and uh, I'll let you go. You, this has been a great talk. You're bullish in uranium for the reasons you've given. You see a slight improvement in gold and silver. Um, what should we avoid? Name an asset or asset class that we should avoid. It doesn't have to be in the resource sector. It could be if you want it to be, but I'll let you answer that. Well, I, you know, stick with my wheelhouse. I would avoid definitely industrial metals for now. As we've okay. spoken before, I'm extremely bullish on copper for decades to come ahead. But even Dr. Copper, I wouldn't buy copper, nickel, lithium. I wouldn't buy any industrial metals. Oh, by the way, platinum and palladium. As expensive as they are, it's a mistake to think of them as precious metals. They're expensive industrial metals. They all get whacked if the recession is deeper uh, and you know scarier than I think the mainstream is giving it credit for. Uh, fundamentals, I'm a fundamentalist, and supply and demand they do matter. But when the traders in the LME and other places that you know, they're looking at this recession becoming from hypothetical to maybe imminent to actually happening now. They sell. They sell energy. They sell industrial minerals. Um, so I, I absolutely would not buy even the most exciting copper stock or any other industrial metal stock right now lithium's until the up recession like, hits. Lithium's up like 80% on the year. I mean, is that is that is that a trend yeah, or is that a just straight a... straight line? But it has rolled over. 
It's, you know, yeah. it was having a fantastic year and it has rolled over. Right. And right. there's a there's a lot of talk now, David, about how hard will the recession hit the demand for electric cars on average? A comparable electric car to an internal combustion engine car is much more expensive. Sorry, is that just electric cars or all cars because people have less money for everything? It can be. It, there's differential. I think okay. a recession would be bad for new car buying in general. Yes. Yeah. But it's it's seen to be likely to hit the electric cars much harder. As you and I record this, I don't know when it goes out, but there's a story in the press today about uh, car company CEOs becoming much less optimistic about how quickly the EV adoption will be. You know, the, they've got the charging infrastructure, all that stuff. But I think this recession thing is part of this, right? If 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 the EV demand would have been like this in 2023, but you've got a big recession, I think you get a big kink downwards, and that would have to weigh. And, and you know. Silver linings, it could be a good thing. It could give supply time to catch up with the demand. But anyway, we're, we're, we're crystal ball gazing right now, as close as I'll get to that. And all I'm saying is I see recession ahead. And that has always, in my experience, been bad for industrial uh, minerals, including mm -hmm. high-flying ones like lithium and ones that I like on a more solid basis like copper. Yeah. Well, Lobo, like I said, you know, crystal balling is one thing. Forecasts, this and that, this price and that price. You could be right, you could be wrong. But really, ultimately, it's the uh, rationale that people care about. I, you know, before I was an anchor at Kitco, and I'll just finish off here just with a personal anecdote. I used to work at a macro research fund. I remember my first month in the job, and the manager I had back then uh, was giving me a story, and he was saying that clients uh, don't really care so much about your end result trade recommendation. They care about the meat of the report, which is your which is your thesis and your logic and your rationale. And uh, back in 2008, a lot of firms had actually called the big crash, but the reasoning was completely off. So that was is that is that technically wrong or is that technically right? Well, we'll, we'll leave that to the clients. We'll leave that to the, uh, <laughs> to the to the to the to the readers and the viewers. But uh, anyway, I appreciate your insights. I appreciate your rationale and your logic is where I'm going with that. So you could be right, you could be wrong, but you know we we appreciate your thorough analysis either way. So thank you. We'll know within a few months. All right. And thank you for watching Kitco News. I'm David Lin. Stay tuned for more and don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel.